We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. This session will contribute to building communities of learning and fostering relationships that create a multiplier effect that we hope will cascade throughout the IGF week of activities and beyond. So that's a bit about the CLX. And now I'll talk briefly about the IGF Youth Ambassador Program. You'll be hearing from some of our ambassadors. And each year, the Internet Society selects 30 young, passionate people to participate in our IGF Youth Ambassador Program, equipping the next generation of internet leaders to collaborate and innovate for a better world. This program is set up to support young adults, 18 to 30 years old. Um, and we do this by uh, making a big impact on internet governance in their communities through uh, educational programs that we have on internet governance. The ambassadors receive training and connect with a network of key influencers in the internet governance sphere. And they gain access to a platform where they can raise their voice on internet issues that matter to them. Next, I'd like to take a moment to say our thank yous for everyone that's come together to, the, to support this program and the CLX today. Thank you to the IGF despite all the technical difficulties with the website today for helping to create this platform for our IGF youth ambassadors to collaborate, exchange ideas, and meet some of the IGF community before all the sessions and the hecticity of the IGF week starts. Thank you to our sponsor, Google, and for all of our in-kind sponsors, partners, course instructors, and program mentors. They have all come together to impart the knowledge of the history of internet governance. They've helped teach our ambassadors journalism and writing for media and online platforms, and have trained our ambassadors in how to lead, present, and participate at the IGF. So today, our session is going to be a bit shorter than the initial three hours, so I'm going to do my best to get through the next bit of information for you all. Uh, we will have, we'll be hearing from 10 of our internet governance IGF youth ambassadors. They will each be speaking for five minutes and will be leading a discussion of their choice for five minutes. After each of these sessions, there will be a 10 minute Q&A. And today our 10 ambassadors will be speaking to us from Argentina, Brazil, Egypt, Ghana, Haiti, India, Malaysia, Turkey, Uganda, and the United States of America. So for any of our audience members who may live and work in these regions and these countries, please feel free to engage in the discussion and Q&A sessions after each ambassador speaks. All right, I will pull up our house rules in a couple of seconds and go over our agenda. Bear with me, I will share my screen right now. All right. So on the agenda today, as I mentioned, let's go back one. Okay. Give me a second as I get this under control. There we go. As I mentioned, you'll be hearing from 10 speakers. We will do five at the first half of the session, then take a break and then do our last five uh, speakers and then wrap up with the conclusion. A reminder of our housekeeping rules to ensure that everyone is able to participate. Please note the following. You are welcome to engage with us via chat or by using the raise your hand function in Zoom to uh, 
let us know that you'd like to comment or ask a question. I'll have some of my colleagues in the chat helping me keep track of all the questions and comments to make sure we get to everyone. Please keep your microphone muted at all times unless you're asking a question or speaking. Please kindly respect our code of conduct. Everyone that's registered for the IGF would have also uh, been given the links to the IGF code of conduct. And a reminder that the session is being recorded with a link for future viewing being circulated by the IGF. And you can also access that via their YouTube channel. And one more note about, uh, as we've all experienced today, a bit of a tech glitch getting online, please be gracious with us and patient as we move through our speakers in the event that a speaker's call gets dropped or there's any technical difficulties. Please be patient with us as we work through those. And thank you again for staying on the call, uh, despite the delays that we've had today. All right, we're going to start jumping into our speakers. For the first half of our session, we will be hearing from Ahmed Al-Mazri, Francis Xavier Enyengat, Edel Kula, and Osai Manu Kadia, and Pranima Tawari. Next in line, we have Francis Xavier. Francis, are you ready to start your presentation? Or are you able to start a bit earlier? Yes, I am ready to present. Do you I need to share so your screen? Uh, my name is Francis Xavier. No, I do not have to share the screen. I can just speak and present. Yes, so digital literacy is a term you may have heard over the past years, but what does it mean and why is it important in the context of Africa? My name is Francis Xavier Inyangat. I am an Internet Society IGF Youth Ambassador 2021. I'm also ITU Generation Connect Youth Envoy. Today, I'm elected to be delivering this digital talk based on my lived experience and formal education as a computer engineering student. Foundational skills, uh, which include literacy, numeracy, and fluency in a language are the building blocks for lifelong learning. Uh, but digital literacy is not just about how to use technology. It's about navigating and communicating through the different digital environment. UN projections show that 60% of Africa's population is under the age of 25, making Africa the youngest population in the continent. Um, and by 2100, it's projected that one of every three people, every three young persons on earth will be African. This projects that the greatest resource Africa will have in the next decades will not be in oil or gold, but it will be on the quality and the resourcefulness of its young generation. So having the right digital skills is extremely important for a generation that is entirely dependent on the internet as a ubiquitous tool for our social life, education, entertainment, business actions, uh, such as online banking. The absence of digital literacy in tomorrow's African generation could be catastrophic in the history of the internet. First, the population rates, the adoption rates for internet would plummet, are therefore undoing the progress made by multiple partners in connecting the unconnected. Secondly, digital literacy perpetrates cyber security risks as ignorant internet users are palatable to exploitation um, by clandestine tricks or uncouth behaviors of internet users. These consequences would be calamitous for the future of the internet. In Africa, formal education and training is majorly passed through uh, primary and secondary education, uh, and the pandemic has exacerbated the use of education technology, commonly known as EdTech, and yet hardware constraints and teachers in my generation of young people need opportunities to acquire and develop these skills and, re and relying on formal secondary education alone may not fill the gap. To save this opportunity, I co-founded an initiative called Ubuntu Internet Podcast to address educational inequalities in accessing digital skills for internet users while centering the needs of young people uh, for a more resilient and responsive recovery. This podcast series will enrich young people with the digital skills, with the digital literacy skills 
such as internet etiquette, cyber ethical conduct, and general best practices for online users and internet governance. Acquiring these core skills will improve and sustain the livelihoods of young people in the 21st century. I ask all of you here today to support our efforts in bridging the digital literacy divide in Africa by partnering to promote the internet literacy in Africa. Now is the time to rethink, review, and reimagine digital education and, and to equip young people with the skills they need to succeed in the fourth industrial revolution. This is an exhaustive discussion we shall pick up during the Internet Society virtual board. Please join me on the 10th of December at 12 UTC time for a continuation of this discussion on digital literacy in the context of Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francis. And I apologize about that um, bit of issue that we've had with that uh, person going off mute and the audio that interrupted you. Uh, so a reminder, Francis just spoke to us about digital literacy and the forecast for Africa. And Francis, I'm wondering, do you have a question to the audience to open up the discussion or the Q&A section? Yes, sure. I would like to ask the audience uh, to please drop in the chat what happens to the millions of school dropouts that cannot acquire digital skills in a classroom setting. As we have seen, according to UNESCO, across Africa, 105 million children and youth were out of school before the pandemic uh, hit, hit the globe. So what happens to the millions of school dropouts that can't acquire these digital skills in a classroom setting? How can we digitally enlighten the already out of school internet users across Africa. Please, I welcome your reactions in the chat. And as well, you can post any questions for me in the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Francis, for that. And Jose, I see your hands up. If you'd like to give your feedback or question, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Um, hi, Francis. Uh, excellent presentation. I really liked it. I wanted to uh, answer your question with another question, if, you, if, you, if I may. Um, so I think you, you raised a very important point, and I think a part of the issue, and I would like to hear your thoughts on this, is that the digital literacy and this being able to provide education um, through digital means in very complicated contexts also talks or leads us to a discussion of internet service providers, what their role is in the in today's economy in any country. Um, there's a lot of saying about them being uh, becoming a gatekeepers. It's a term that is used or 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 the internet on being understood as a public utility. So I wanted to see your thoughts on, on this idea of digital literacy and how to expand it on the, the role that internet service providers will have obviously in hand with, with the government in order to provide this, uh, this service. Thank you. Yes, thanks so much, Jose, for your question. So the internet service providers across Africa contribute to a larger percentage of those who pay taxes to the government and they generate a lot of revenue from the work they do in providing the internet services across Africa. So therefore, it should be part of their social corporate responsibility to enlighten a younger generation, probably through, uh, through initiatives such as a graduate internships, and as well as also uh, through initiatives such as fellowships to enlighten a digitally enlightened generation of young people. So therefore, internet service providers cannot benefit, cannot prosper, without a, a generation that knows how to use the internet technology. Please do continue. Uh, yes, so as part of the answer to this question, on the role that internet service providers can play in helping to bring a digitally alive generation of young people. I can point out some examples of initiatives that have been done by a few of the internet service providers across Africa that are helping to train young people in digital skills. Uh, Microsoft has a project called Microsoft for Africa that is training a post a recent graduates in digital skills, especially IT and coding. These skills are necessary for the generation that is going to be the future leaders of the internet. Uh, MTN is also running initiatives such as postgraduate internships and trainings for young people. These are initiatives that other service providers across the continent can adapt in providing digital skills to 
the population of youth who are already in school and those who cannot access school but also need to access the internet because we need the internet to be open, accessible, secure for everyone, who, whether you're in school or out of school. So therefore, the internet service providers play a very important role, very critical in providing digital skills and also promoting the use of the internet across the continent. Thank you, Francis. And I'm opening up the floor again to any of our IGF attendees who may have any comments or questions for Francis on this very relevant topic that he's raised for us today. We have uh, time for probably one or two more questions or comments. Uh, please, Marily, in case there are questions in the chat, you could help me read them loud so that I can follow up. Yes, I'm checking the chat right now and I don't see any questions. So maybe everyone's processing their questions and we can they can uh, contact us at a later date. Everyone uh, who is registered for the IGF, you would have seen all the attendees on your IGF uh, community profile. So please feel free to connect our ambassadors that way if you would, would like to do so. Uh, all right, next up, thank you, Francis, for your discussion and for really toughing it out through a lot of technical issues that we had. You did a great job with your presentation and I see you've dropped your LinkedIn uh, profile link in the chat section for anyone that wants to uh, follow up with you and connect on the work that you're doing. I invite everyone to please do so if you are also doing work across the African continent that aligns with the work that Francis is doing. Thank you, Francis. Next up, we have Edel Kula from Turkey. She will be talking to us today about digital literacy and community empowerment. Edel, you have the floor. Marley, I'm sorry, but I think uh, she's having trouble accessing the session. Okay, we may have lost Edel. We will get back to her once she's able to rejoin us. Thank you, Eliana, for that update. Uh, we will move ahead with our next speaker in line, Osai Manu Kajia. Are you ready to present, Osai? And if you are, I welcome you to take the floor. Osai is joining us from Ghana and he will be speaking about the gender digital divide. You have the floor, Sai. Good day, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from. I hope I'm audible enough. My name is Osei Menu Keja, speaking from Ghana. Today, I'll be talking on a very broad, complex topic, the gender digital divide. IGF Ambassador 2021, Internet Society Ambassador, and from Manila to Suva, from Nairobi, through to my country, Accra, through to Kuala Lumpur, internet has come as an infinite resource. The internet is a major driver in trying to bridge the economic gap and also one of the main drivers in attaining the sustainable development goals, especially goal five, goal one, and goal 13. But here is the case, the pandemic has exacerbated, has heightened the digital divide. And especially gender, the digital divide, gender, and the marginalized group have difficulty in accessing the internet. Recent reports by the Internet Telecommunication Union, ITU, suggest that 58% of women are affected by this digital divide as opposed to 42% of men. Prior to this, we did a, big, a quick survey assessing the various demographics from Africa to Ghana, Kenya, Nairobi, 
we did find out that affordability is a big hindrance in people accessing the internet. It was a very, very big challenge. On the average, people do spend $2.60 a day on one gig data. And this was quite pronounced in the case of Africa, Kenya and Africa being the major part of our survey. We did also find out that some parts of Africa also have cultural biases and stereotyping and gender bias to adoption of ICC tools and mobile phones so that you can get online. These are all major barriers. Other barriers as digital literacy and digital skills has also been a challenge. With the pandemic still moving on, still progressing, right now we have the Omnicron variant, a lot of online activities. Right now we've moved from the days of traditional learning to click and order, buying things online and also digital education. This has been a major, major big challenge. Where do we find the solution? I intend to collaborate with a lot of my ambassadors on this platform, youth ambassadorship, continue the engagement, continue the, the being part of the solution. I do believe primarily we can't be in silos, but we need to collaborate in just like the multi-stakeholder approach, bottom up. I intend to, to also, through webinar sessions, through podcasts, continue the engagements, and also other people who are already in, with working on bridging the digital divide. I know a lot of people are working on um, connect, uh, connectivity. I intend to take that, collaborate with them, work with them, internet new, connect with them and also secondly drive home awareness and education through my publications writing and thirdly also try to create awareness through the local schools and the grassroots i would like to end by asking this question the future is digital the future is for us all. Digital economy, digital education. Do you oppose the idea that every human being on the planet deserves the internet? Thank you very much. Thank you, Sai, for your presentation. Uh, I think it's a very relevant and it's very interesting that we have uh, a male individual that's really interested in being a strong ally, an active ally in helping to lead this work for your region in Ghana. Uh, Osai, maybe can you repeat your question for the audience? And audience, if you have an answer or feedback to Osai's question, please raise your hand or drop that in the chat section. Osai, if you can repeat your question. Okay, so I was asking the future being digital with being said that the traditional economy is going to be replaced by the digital economy the future digital education do you oppose the idea that every human being on the planet deserves the internet if so why thank you very much Thank you for your question. It is a very provocative question, especially since the Internet Society, one of our goals is to connect everyone and connect the remaining 48% of uh, the population around the world that's not connected to the Internet. Do we have any comments or answers to Osai's question from the audience? Okay, maybe I will broaden the frame of your question, Osai. We do have a number of our IGF youth ambassadors. Oh, I see Fred. Fred, thank you for raising your hands. You have the floor with your feedback or question. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm 
Fred Kwajua Azori from Ghana, and uh, I speak as uh, an IGF Youth Ambassador today. Yes, uh, I'll say the question is very provocative. Uh, it actually uh, brings a lot of thoughts into the, uh, the reason why the internet is much more important. So I would say no. Uh, I don't oppose the fact that everyone on the globe or the planet should have access to the internet because uh, this is the reason why uh, the internet governance forum in itself is much important as we have uh, one of the uh, major topics in this year's IGF being universal access and meaningful connectivity. We are trying to ensure that everyone uh, in the world is able to have equal opportunity to access the internet. We are aware uh, through a report by the UN that uh, about 37% of the global population is not connected at all to the internet. And this is actually a problem. We have uh, several reports which also increases that percentage by about 47% of the global population not having access to the internet. You and I today are able to participate on this platform right now, just because we have access to uh, unrestricted, unglittering internet. Permit me to say, uh, at the start of this event, we had a little glitch where uh, most of us were finding it very difficult to get connected to the internet or connected to this particular session. And this in itself demonstrates the reason why it is much more important to ensure everyone has equal access to the internet. And equal means unrestricted, very reliable access to the internet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred, for your contributions to the conversation. Um, up next, we have Ethan and then Alu Wasion. Hopefully, I pronounced that close to correct. Uh, first up, we have Ethan. Ethan, you have the floor. Um, thank, thank you so much, uh, Osei, for that uh, contribution. Um, my, my question, rather a contribution to what you've just said, is around whether we should go beyond just um theoretically saying everyone deserves to to access to the internet and actually put it into law and say well is it a basic right um that you can actually go and enforce to your government and um your other stakeholders that you can actually go enforce and actually say hey i actually this this is my right this is a fundamental right um that should be granted to me as an individual and um, that that question, you know, also just brings a, a whole can of worms because it's also asking um, how fundamental is the internet now to our everyday life? And um, I, you know, ca call me biased, but I, I, you know, given the platform that we're we're on, but I, I believe that it it should be. Um, I believe we're now in the, that digital area as you were talking about. And um, besides all the cultural uh, biases that, that, that have been mentioned here and um, the, the gender injustice when it comes to access to, to the internet, I believe it should be presented as a basic human right because now we can't do without it. Um, and it should be something that is prioritized just, just as much as your other human rights are. So that's my contribution to, to a very, um, interesting conversation you started. Thank you, Ethan. And before we move on to the next speaker, I'm gonna read a comment from Jose in our chat section. And he says, hey, Osai, maybe we could rephrase your question and ask if we should legally recognize access to the internet as a human right, and then ask what we could do to make that a reality. And I think that overlaps with what um, Ethan has just shared. Uh, we did have another hand up uh, who wanted to give feedback or contribution. I see that hand is gone. Do we have any other attendees who would like to comment or ask a question? Jose, I see your hand up. Do you have the floor? I really like Ethan's um, point. And I would say uh, to, to add to that point, he's saying 
if actually recognizing something as internet access in law would make any kind of difference or is there something that we should even ask more and it would be really important then if we think that is a fundamental right that we not only say what well, we should establish it in the law and but then that needs to come with specific public policies that actually bring that access into into our reality so i, I think to uh, Jose, i would re recommend this is a very um humble uh, opinion just to say that maybe in this discussion of gender and everything we should also think about the, the the importance of recognizing as a right, and then from that, how can we bind states to actually take action to that point? But yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And Osai, did you want to respond to Jose? We have time for one more person, and I see that Olawesen has been waiting to uh, contribute. Olawesen, do you still want to give your feedback or ask a question? Yeah, I want to give my feedback. Thank you, Osai, for the wonderful presentation. I would like to say that uh, internet should be a human right for all, and uh, you have to look at the aspect of uh, technological adoption. is very important and germane to this discourse, because if people do not adopt the use of this internet technology, there's no way that we can have uh, it as a basic human right for all. So we have to concert our efforts towards making technology available to all and making them realize it is their basic human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you for that contribution, Alawaisen. And Osai, I would say you have 30 seconds uh, okay. to wrap up your- Thank session. you very much, the contribution from Jose, Ita, my good friend and Fred. Very good, very nice contribution. How fundamental recognizing that as human rights. I think the ECOWAS court last year during the pandemic did rule that, but it is it, very complicated issue, very, very complicated issue. Working on gender data, you need to know the cultural nuances and how even the in various states it has been put out there should be seen as a, a fundamental human rights state actors continue not to provide access to a lot of people. And I, I do believe it involves a concerted collaborative effort. And I'm willing to work with anyone who is working on community networks, who is working to just bridge the divide to engage. And thank you very much. Thank you, Osai, and thank you for everyone who uh, contributed their feedback and their questions. And up next, we are going to circle back to Ahmed Al-Mazri, who will be speaking to us from Egypt on digital citizenship in the age of digital transformations in North America. I believe the IT team said we should be able to share our screens now, Ahmed, if you want to try that again. Uh, okay, we can try. Uh, I will try just a second. Uh, I think I, 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 I'll speak directly easier. So uh, I was speaking about like digital transformation and how um, citizenship and actually the importance of the concept of um, digital citizenship in North Africa specifically and also in the other regions of the world. And why I'm speaking about this topic, because nowadays the topic of digital transformation is booming and um, is becoming common to hear serious discussion about how to digitally transform education services, uh, public services and business activities. And many voices believe that digital transformation would boost transparency, promote efficiency and eliminate corruption. However, many of us misuse mess the fact that um, unless we have users who are capable of using the digitally transformed uh, services correctly and meaningfully, all the digital transformation efforts will go in vain. Or even things can get worse by uh, uh, having users who start misused uh, these services like just what happened. So 
What I'm saying that it is important at this stage to promote and raise awareness on the concept of digital citizenship and its role in achieving the goal of transformation of our society into digitally oriented societies. Because digital transformation is not only about transforming digital infrastructure and services, but also from transforming skills and the human capabilities. Unless we have digitally competent citizens, we will not be able to harness the outcomes of digital transformation. And uh, this actually leads me to uh, a very, very important point, which is what is digital citizenship? How to define digital citizenship? And basically, digital, digital citizenship is using information technology in order to engage with uh, the society, the business community, and government on the digital environment. And in order to be a digital citizen, you need to have the required knowledge, skills, and access to effectively use the digital ser services and uh, effective, actively participate in digital uh, social activities, and finally, wisely consume the digital uh, uh, content. And for example, like um, unless citizens are able to use online payment methods and internet services, they will not be able to benefit from the e-public services offered by the government and they will fail to contribute to the digital economy. Therefore, the topic of digital uh, citizenship contains uh, like overlapping uh, themes such as uh, first, raising awareness on the basic cybersecurity practices, also enhancing digital literacy among the citizens and their ability to meaning meaningfully uh, use the digital platforms and interact, uh, interact with uh, 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 digital um, uh, content. And uh, uh, due its st strategic importance and in line with uh, the recent digital transformation agendas implement implemented by the governments all uh, all over the world and especially in uh, the North African region, actually, I'm interested in working on raising awareness on the topic of digital citizenship as part of uh, my role as Internet Society uh, Ambassador, Youth Ambassador, and I'm, I'm also happy to see that the Internet Society Egypt chapter is interesting in providing their resources in 2020 to spread awareness about the concept. And uh, the main four focus of the project that uh, we agreed to work on is first uh, highlighting the, the current digital transformation plan and uh, the current plans to digitally transform the uh, infrastructure in the North African region, and, set, and second, addre addressing uh, the status of digital citizenship in North Africa and how um, are we behind or how are we um, on a uh, schedule of having digitally oriented citizen, and also and finally discussing the role of civil and society. And all right, sorry, Ahmed, if we can get the IGF IT team to boot uh, Jason Blue again, please. Thank you, Ahmed. I apologize. Continue. You're still on mute, Ahmed. Sorry, yes. back again. Thank you. And uh, the last part of our project actually focuses on addressing the role of the civil society and academic and institution in empowering, empowering digital citizenship. And uh, here we are talking about uh, not just the government rule, we are moving to the rule of the civil society, how the civil society can contribute uh, to the goal of having digitally oriented uh, uh, society. And uh, here I would like to ask you all, like, what do you think are the main challenging for digital citizenship? Yes, many governments now are interested in digital transformation, but also I think there are like different uh, barriers against uh, digital citizenship that differs from region to region. And since we, here we have uh, uh, people coming from the different regions, I think it would be interesting to see the like the differences uh, between uh, the uh, the different regions in terms of digital citizenship.
Thank you, Ahmed, for your session and that opening question to open up your discussion. I see Edel with her hands up. Edel, you have the floor and welcome back. Hello, Marilee, and thank you, Ahmed, for your presentation. Um, I would like to respond to your question on about the challenges against digital citizenship. Uh, and I agree with the point that uh, all regions are different in their own unique circumstances and dynamics. And I would like to reflect on, for example, uh, yes, this is uh, one of the most uh, important challenges is just uh, social cultural dynamics, actually, because as uh, as we are working on the N uh, NGO and civil society side on Turkey, when we got to the society and talk about the notion of digital citizenship concept, uh, they always uh, respond with some kind of uh, untrusted approach, like um, if. Uh, they they ask they always ask if they try to learn about this new kind of things. Um, they they are uh, simply scared of just uh, being um, unlawful and being uh, privacy unsavvy. I mean, <laughs> they are uh, scared because of um, they don't um, grasp the notion of digital uh, citizenship. Maybe. And for example, uh, <clears throat> when uh, privacy issues are held, are upheld by our civil society community, uh, they always ask, uh, we don't have anything to hide, even in digital places. And it's, it doesn't matter um, where you ask to the senior citizens or even youth communities. Uh, for, this is an example uh, from a privacy perspective, but we all know that privacy has many core relations to the core human rights, like human integrity and um, like um, human dignity. But uh, yes, first of all, we should we should just prevent this uh, this kind of approach uh, from fear culture and. Um, protectionist cultures yeah this is this would be my take on your question thank you thank you the yes i totally agree like this would always be an issue and this will differ differ from country to country based on um like uh, how the civil society is perceived uh, in these countries but I think it would be safe to say that if here, like, um, we are more concerned about like how to make the civil society play more role in actually educating the citizens and how to use the internet services, how uh, the civil society and institutions can play a role on uh, spreading awareness on the basic uh, uh, cybersecurity practices. And I think no political regime will have an issue with uh, such a uh, basic role. Actually, I believe that um, all the regime, r regardless of their agenda, they, would be, they should be supporting such um, initiatives because um, they already have m many governments, they already have um digital transformation plans in place um, and these digital transformation plans will not be effective unless we have citizens who can use them so yeah but i totally understand um your point and elena yes eliana you are eliana. you have Sorry. the floor thank you and um, thank you ahmed for the presentation is certainly one of the priorities that I think countries should be implementing also for making, you know, relevant content online, just bringing services online uh, makes being online more enticing and more useful for citizens. But uh, leveraging on your uh, on your last point, I do agree, no political party or no government will ever say, I don't think that this will benefit my citizens. I think the benefits are clearly evident, maybe not for a uh, well, there are certain barriers for users to recognize the, the, 
the benefits of online services. But I do think uh, that one question that we may have to ask in these digital transformation processes is um, these processes being manual, being in paper. Uh, those systems, as they are in place for so long, they may benefit someone in some part along the process. Uh, what personal experience that I have uh, back home in Argentina, we had a platform for uh, digital bureaucracy for people to be able to perform the, uh, some task totally online without having to go to a governmental office. And one of them was uh, the ability to create a company, uh, an enterprise totally online in 24 hours. Now, um, this has been like a transformation process that has found to be very difficult because the act of the citizen to be able to go to the office to make that bureaucracy in person allowed uh, for some officers to take bribes on uh, certain processes being more efficient or more rapid results than others. So I think a, a question that we need to ask ourselves and civil organizations have to keep, keep asking themselves is, who is the current system benefiting and responding to those private interests when addressing digital transformation processes? Thank you. Thank you, Eliana, for that. Um, and Ahmed, we also have a comment in the chat that I will read before we move on to your response and Ethan. So I see from Aloisan we have in the chat, Thank you, Ahmed, for your presentation. The main challenges for digital citizenship in Africa include lack of digital education, inadequate infrastructure, inadequate effective awareness creation, and lack of cooperation from stakeholders. So this is a common theme that we've been hearing so far today. Also, concerns have been raised about over-reliance on government policies to address the problem. It is necessary to encourage a broad education that has the necessary skills to enable digital citizenship. Uh, Ahmed, maybe if you want to respond to uh, Eliana's uh, contribution as well as Aloisan, and then Ethan will be our last question for your session. Um, yes, Eliana, uh, I, I believe yes. Like uh, I totally agree with um, all your points. And um, I, I think like digital transformation gives us a chance to uh, overcome corruption and also to enhance efficiency. But unless we correctly use it, we can have actually like a backfire impact. And what we are seeing actually, what, what just happened today is uh, one of the examples, like 10 years ago or like 20 years ago, we will not be able to have like, um, an uh, online conference like this and back then like if er anyone saw that okay what will happen like um it could be a good, good idea that actually it would be an awesome idea to have like different people uh having a platform that allows them to communicate universally um on the same time but then when this happens someone is trying to violate and someone is trying to actually like uh, uh, interrupt uh, the meeting, like what just happened? Why this happened? This happened because of what we are we are talking about, like the lack of digital citizenship and the lack of um, awareness. So yes, I agree. This transformation can enhance uh, efficiency and transparency, but unless we have the skills to benefit from this, actually, digital transformation could backfire, and. Uh, we can move to Ethan. I think you had you raised you raised your hand. Yeah, I'll just give a quick comment. Thanks, thanks for that, by the way. Um, I think there there's what we've kind of raised, which is the awareness part. Um, but close to the awareness or, or education part of things um, is the idea of um, of upscaling the actual digital skills, uh, or at least the skill set involved in a community. So, for for example, in 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 Africa, if you were to speak about all these, you know, technical things that we're talking about that can happen on a digital platform, um, and all the benefits that are that arise from being in a digital environment, it's okay. Then, how do you 
one make them aware but importantly how do you make them competitive with other markets in that um in that same space and it's that part where by you know one 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 of the comments was let's not leave it just to government but it's one part is that is that part where by how can we make sure that our citizens actually have the necessary skills and can move from the skill sets that they already have to new skill sets um that allow them to operate in this environment Thank you, Ethan, for your feedback. You're all addressing some really complex um, topics right now. And Ahmed, if folks would like to continue the conversation with you, please uh, leave in the chat how they can do so. And uh, attendees, if you'd like to continue this conversation and this line of inquiry with Ahmed and follow his work, the great work that he's doing, please do follow up with him uh, with the contact that he shares with you in the chat section. Up next, we have Fidel Kula. She is back with us and she will be speaking to us from Turkey on digital literacy and community empowerment. Fidel, you have the floor. Thank you, Marilee. And hi, everyone. Uh, it's Fidel, an MS student of science and technology policy studies and also a graduate researcher with a low background. I am very happy to join the discussion from Turkey. And since my research covers societal and legal implications of emerging ICT technologies, I have been inevitably uh, been into activism on digital citizenship and also digital literacy. That's why today I'm going to talk about digital literacy with all of you. And as my colleagues stated previously, we are heading towards an age of the Internet of Bodies and so-called metaverse, in which ethical debates and policy questions are hovering here and there. And likewise, the more our lives datafied into the digital sphere, the more we are prone to new challenges and risks throughout our journey on the internet. However, it is obvious not all countries and regions are on the same track with this technological leap and its critical discussion. Having most interactions migrate to the digital, irrespective of age, expertise, and social demographics, it is still not possible for a quite big portion of society to realize the implications of this strict technological shift. Similarly, it is not reasonable to expect people to think about internet governance issues or the implications of new technologies when populations tackle with um, dealing economic crises, armed conflict, political polarization, starving and radical terrorism. Just because of these reasons, it is of dire importance to raise awareness and empower communities around the concept of digital literacy. This issue is crucial because digital literacy provides us the ground for safe and fair interaction with digital technologies and generally with the internet. Moreover, by implying awareness among society, the concept itself helps the promotion of digital rights. Um, for example, in order to be aware of new kinds of biases and also discrimination uh, in digital sphere, and also to defend our rights in the digital sphere, we should be armed with the appropriate knowledge in the first place, right? Therefore, no one can claim that digital human rights and a safe and fair internet experience are only for a specific uh, or elitist portion of society because we are all human beings and we should be equal in terms of accessing resources and enjoying our human rights. At this point, I would like uh, it would it would be beneficial to realize that every country and region have their own social, cultural, and political dynamics, and taking into account uh, regional needs and custom, um, I would like to suggest broad capacity building programs should be built that are designed for special target groups such as senior citizens, PVDS community children and youth, and also women. In this aspect, I would like to speak on our national initiative, Vigi Citizen. 
that is a digital citizenship project in which we are promoting the notion of digital literacy among various stakeholders within society. We have an online education platform that is constituted of five modules based on information technology literacy, digital citizenship, digital life culture, cybersecurity, and also internet governance. We also offer face-to-face on-demand lectures and training of training courses on the subject matter to universities, academia, other NGOs, firms and companies from private sector and also municipalities and governmental institutions. Um, the Digital Citizen Project has come into reality with the efforts of a team of calibrated people between Internet Society Turkey chapter, like me, and Media Literacy Society. We Firstly, uh, we have initiated our project with a grant from Internet Society Foundation. And now, happily, we are on the verge of our exponential growth with increased interactions with other stakeholders. And we are widening our impact area, enriching our educational materials, and growing our online platform day by day. Finally, I would like to end my speech with a call. As an emerging capacity building project on digital literacy, digitism, we are seeking partners, serious partners, to collaborate and engage on the concept of digital literacy and citizenship. We are fully open and eager for any kind of collaboration with similar initiatives worldwide. And we especially value voices from the Global South, Asia Pacific, Africa, and South America. And it would be great to connect with people with similar stories in digital literacy. And I would like to thank all of the audience for listening to my part. And I would like to hear thoughts and ideas about further promotion of digital literacy and community empowerment. Thank you. Mary. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have someone that has a question or feedback, comments? Thank you, Ido. I'm seeing a lot of waving hands, celebrating your discussion points. Thank you, everyone, for that encouragement. And thank you for such a thorough ask of the audience. I think it's definitely important for us to identify the, the intersectionality of the work that we're all doing around the world and the need to uh, come together to really expedite the process of the doing part of the work. It's one thing to identify issues and problems, but it's another thing to actually start doing the work, planning the work and implementing on the ground. Uh, are there any audience members that would like to uh, reply to Edel's questions or would like to connect with her work or are doing similar work to what she's talked about today? Hello, uh, here is Pedro Lana for the record from the Youth SIG and Youth Observatory. Um, I would just like to hear a little bit more about the five mo modules that she said the learning part is divided. It's not a question, it's just to understand a little bit more of what is uh, taught to people during these phases. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your feedback. And uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, you are um, you are questioning the uh, structure of our online educational platform and modules on five uh, specific topics. Exactly. Yes, yes. This is um, simply uh, our project uh, is constituted uh, with two um, structured faces. Uh, one of them is just online learning platform and one of it's just uh, our face-to-face -face educational materials. Uh, we actually, I can pass the um, website link to the chat if you wish. And um, basically what we're doing on our online education platform is just we have interactional courses like edX or Coursera but in Turkish, of course, because uh, we are um, aiming uh, to national uh, I mean, uh, citizenship. 
that uh, after the courses, we are offering the digital citizenship identity, a badge and a, a completion of cert a certification of completion. And uh, of course, it's uh, all verified by the Internet Society Turkey chapter and Media Literacy Society. And we, uh, what we're doing uh, with our online education platform is uh, we are going to stakeholders from academia, uh, from NGOs and private sector. And uh, we see that there is a lack of digital literacy, both in the curriculum of universities and both in the work culture of a private sector and also public institutions. And um, in our interactions, people just um, give their feedback with, with a very big uh, curiosity in our educational platform. And I can simply uh, pass the website link here. Um, Mary Lee, could you please save it yeah, and send is... it to us afterwards because we don't have access to the chat here, but <laughs> I would like to see it. Thanks. Oh, okay. Sorry, can you repeat uh, your request? Uh, just can you save the link and send after uh, afterwards to the mentors group or somewhere else because we don't have access yes. to the chat right here. Yes, we, I can definitely do that. Thank you for raising that, that concern. And thank you for your contribution and Ido for a very uh, relevant and also region specific presentation on the work that you're doing. And it's so uh, encouraging to know that you've actually, it, you've actually been able to move into implementation and actually prototyping the idea of the work that you, you want to see in your region. That is great. I hope for anyone that's listening on the line that uh, is working on similar projects or that would like to contribute and partner with Adil, please do reach out to her via the links that she's shared in the chats and uh, on the IGF community platform as well. If you would like to reach out to our speakers, that's another opportunity to do so. Adil, do you have any closing remarks before we move on to our next speaker? Well, thank you, Marilee. Uh, I, I will be sharing the social media contact for our uh, initiative on the chat, and I would be happy if you can also pass the chat into the uh, IGF on-site participations. And this is all my take. Thank you so much. Thank you, Idil. Next up, we're going to hear from our IGF Youth Ambassador, Purnima Tawari from India, and she's going to be talking to us about digital access and inclusion. Purnima, you have the floor. Thank you, Marli, and hello to everybody who whomsoever is, is in this particular call. Um, what the discussion that we just had was very really interesting. Uh, so my topic largely concerns to what Idol said. Uh, it was more about she she discussed about the idea of digital literacy. I'm gonna relate it further to uh, imparting digital literacy to the digital natives under the larger thematic of digital access and inclusion. So internet governance is about creating a space for multi-stakeholder dialogue, as we all know. Let's suppose if we place all these actors, uh, whichever work in the internet diaspora, like users, tech companies, governments, civil society organization, internet service providers, telecom companies, et cetera, and arrange them in a scale of one to 10, and 10 being the highest in terms of who commands the highest power in shaping the internet policy. You or probably I would place government or tech companies at the level of 10. Now, if you take the same, same, uh, same actors and if you look them at look at them from a different variable uh, in terms of who has the highest vested interest in internet policy from 1 to 10, and again, 10 being the highest, we would play this digital users at 10 who would have concerns about cyber payments, hacking, malware attacks, invasion of privacy and surveillance. Therefore, it, it, it becomes very clear that users who have the highest stake and interest involved in the internet ecosystem also seems to we have seems to command lesser power in comparison to the other entities like government or probably companies. At this point, as either uh, um, um, and 
also Ahmed uh, previously mentioned that civil societies do need to come forward, take the charge, and should be spreading awareness on what the implications of these policies actually are. I believe that the future of internet will be negotiated and constructed by the communities. So building and strengthening your own community's capabilities with regard to the online space is a responsibility I believe that we all should be bearing. We should be collectively promoting the dialogue which advocates for digital access and inclusion because in the digital world that is the first step that's a foundation now i'll just briefly talk about the infrastructural challenges that exist so in developing countries uh, there, there are a lot of issues uh, in terms of infrastructure like digital divide issues of accessibility reliance on slow speed connection and even dependence on a single device in a family setup i come from chatisgarh uh, that that is in india chatisgarh is a lesser developed state in indian india and it, it it has been formed in 2001 so growing up there was a very limited access to media exposure which meant limited access to opportunities as well hence equitable internet is an idea equitable access of internet specifically it's an idea which is very personal to me and very very close to me so so i believe that uh, if the access isn't equitable we would have a fractured space which couldn't be considered democratic in any way i'll now talk about uh, how should we promote the idea of rice based approach we need to promote a dialogue which would make the users aware that uh, they have the right to consent consent to digital payments consent to agree to cookie usage consent to privacy this this consent is the power that we own to shape the digital world customized uh, just according to how we want that's that's exactly how an individual could uh, contribute in shaping the internet so now this particular idea of consent it's not just limited to the content or the front end part but it is also about agreeing to the infrastructure of internet we can consent for stronger policies regarding encryption data governance we can advocate for our terms in matter of how long we want our, our data to be retained how promptly we want law enforcement agencies and the big tech to sort of intervene in the cases of cyber bullying fake news hate speech um, etc it is also our responsibility as a digital user to contribute in creation of uh, of of digital literacy and promote that particular dialogue that would teach a digital native that commercialization of privacy doesn't has to be a norm now moving on to the idea of inclusive spaces the discomfort that is experienced by digital natives uh, who who would be using internet as a medium of, of for the first time it's a, it's a very serious concern this means that those someone might use a smartphone for business or education purpose but they would still be very much unaware about their digital footprints and their transaction of privacy for information in the social media platforms now younger people from my region solely and uh, understand and explore internet via social media platforms such kind of onboarding process needs to be addressed the internet beyond social media platform beyond being a recreational tool need to be introduced to the, introduced to the younger population it could be delivered by providing wifi access in public spaces like bus stand public libraries etc the dialogue these 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 ideas of right based approaches could be delivered through stronger and frequent dialogues and uh, now to just to take this idea forward um i would be discussing on how there there is a very limited dialogue dialogue on the idea of privacy and user generated data so the rural communities in my area aren't much familiar with the concepts like privacy as privacy in itself it's a very west bound idea in itself uh, and it's not uh, prevalent in south asian communities it is very common for someone to ask me kasa khais which in chatisgarh means what vegetables did you had for your meal uh, for your lunch or your dinner so now digital right advocates have also long proposed uh, digital literacy as a very valuable skill and concept yet it remains something that that's very much limited to the developed countries and urban setup the awareness on these concept is yet to become a part of everyday discourse to address this particular challenge i am working on a project on developing digital media literacy among rural communities of chatisgarh that's my region under this particular ambassador program i'm currently delivering digital literacy workshops which will be which will be touching upon the uh, basic ideas on what it means to be a digitally literate person the importance of verification uh, of information whatever comes to you through social media 
because as we know uh, misinformation actually have uh, real world consequences uh, when it come when it when, when when it came to a pandemic uh, also i would be exploring the concept of privacy in online platforms etc so these workshop would be targeted for social groups like farmer groups uh, artisan circles women of self help groups uh, would be a micro entrepreneur educational spaces like higher secondary schools um, uh, training centers and colleges the idea at large is to inform the user on how to better navigate in uh, navigate through the internet the question that i seek uh, to answer and i would also sort of uh, leave it for some in all of you to sort of ponder upon is how can we better create um, uh, how can we better create an organized sort of onboarding process for those digital natives who have just crossed the digital divide that's all from my end thank you Thank you, Pranima, for your discussion and your question to the audience. Um, audience, uh, if any of you would like to respond to Pranima's open question to you all, please do. If you have questions or comments, uh, feel free to raise your hand or simply come off of mute and ask your question or give us your comments or type it into the chat section. And Pranima, if you may want to repeat your question, that would be great as well. Sure. So the question that I intend to put forward is how do we create a better and organized system uh, of kind of an onboarding process for the digital divides, uh, for the digital natives for that matter, who have just crossed the digital divide. You know, so the idea is obviously the digital. It lies in the in the concept of digital literacy, but you know, how can we further better in deliver it in a better way? All right, thank you for your question. We will give the attendees. Uh, I see Edel. Edel, your hand is up. You have the floor, and then Eliana after Edel. Thank you, Merrily. Um, maybe uh, one of the one of the answers to the uh, Purnima's uh, question would be just strengthening the conditions for human rights would be a, an asset because um, over the cohorts of policymaking uh, discussions on internet governance issues, one of the most important things that I realized uh, with my colleagues from places which in political polarization and economic crisis is just um, unless we promote the notion of human rights and unless we have the stability for democratic institutions, we cannot even talk about uh, a simple issue of digital literacy because people have different inclinations about digital issues, technology, and computational and ICT technologies. They always question and ask, and ask uh, with uh, an atmosphere of fear. And this is just because of the instability of democratic institutions, the, um, the, the bad conditions on human rights environment, and Yes, these kinds of things. Uh, and uh, I believe that if we can, I mean, however, somehow, if we can achieve a kind of stability on democracy and human rights, it will provide the, it, it will provide the open and free place to discuss these kinds of internet governance issues like disinformation on online spaces, privacy, data protection, and so on. There are myriad of issues on, for example, autonomous autonomy harms, like uh, harms that are uh, occurring for not being um, consented well, such as um, or coercion or chilling effects, or for example, um, uh, viewpoint discrimination. There is a thing called viewpoint discrimination on online platforms, and. Um, this is this is a discussion on uh, content regulation on platforms, but um, 
all of these questions and all of these discussions uh, will be freed if we have the place, the right place for freedom of speech and freedom of ideas and thoughts. Yeah, this is Thank my you. answer, Purnima. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rito, for your contribution to the conversation. I think um, one thing I'll mention brief is, briefly before we move on to Eliana is that what we're asking for here, what I'm hearing multiple ambassadors asking for is really buy-in and support from key multi-stakeholders within the greater scope of the conversations that we're having. So it's one thing for the, the population to say democratically, we citizens need this, we want this. It's one thing for our technical communities to say, yes, we're here to build the programs and the online learning uh, courses. It's one thing for our educators to say that as well and to be on board, but we need the, the higher level multi-stakeholders to really uh, support this work and endeavor. So if we have any of those individuals on the call today, truly we're looking forward to having you connect with our ambassadors to help move their work forward. Okay. Next up, we have Eliana. Eliana, you'll be the last person for the session with Pranima. You have the floor. Thank you, Marley. I will try to keep it short. Uh, thank you, Pranima. That was uh, really on point. Uh, one thing that I will say, I mean, maybe bringing the conversation down a little bit, is um, there are some studies that I think that are also very on point, uh, establishing a relationship between digital skills and years of schooling. So. I think in this, as any other issue, uh, a societal issue, um, there is a correlation between a lot of indicators and this one. Um, I always, when coming to digital literacy and when I talk about digital literacy, I always think about my uh, a personal anecdote, uh, which is my father being doubtful about using his credit card information to buying something online. Uh, he was doubtful. I was like, yeah, are you sure? Uh, what is coming down from that? And at that time, we both share the same uh, um, doubts about uh, going about the internet and how to share our personal information. And that is not often the case. Uh, there's a question about how to get young people uh, to be safe online and how to uh, explode uh, all the opportunities that don't like life brings um, but i think it's also important to keep in mind the elders and the persons that are no longer in the education system and how to uh, get them to be active and involved in digital um, initiatives and also how that it is important for community engagement and then being a, a still a very big part of um, society um, just a contextual comment thank you Thank you. And Pranima, I will leave you with the last 30 seconds for your session to give us your closing remarks and any comments from those that have shared uh, in your session today. Right. Um, so, Iyana, I totally agree with what you have said about, you know, including, uh, uh, you know, uh, adults, people who have actually left out the um, educational system. And uh, so, you know, to address this um, as of now under this particular project on digital literacy, I am sort of, uh, you know, I'm not including any age bars particularly, uh, meaning that we will be targeting social groups for that matter, but obviously, uh, you know, including people who, who are sort of, you know, uh, of 60 plus or somewhere, I mean, they are largely uh, sort of away from the digital transformation that's happening around them. And we certainly need, need to include them in such kind of dialogue. So I, I certainly appreciate what you have said. And now uh, um, just to address adults' points as well, uh, here. Um, so I personally believe that, you know, uh, my world, it's, it's being transformed as we are talking right now. So, you know, fintechs are taking over the traditional market, edtechs are taking over the traditional market. So, startups are, uh, you know, just mushrooming in everywhere. Unicorns are being developed on an everyday basis. So, you know, amongst this entire idea, what actually concerns me is that, you know, um, the, the people who are crossing the digital divide, you know, who, who are actually, you know, who, who could be the first person to attend 
school in their first first person who would be attending school in their family so now that sort of person would actually need some sort of ideological understanding on how ideas like privacy and all of these work in uh, digital domain so that that becomes very uh, you know per- pertinent to us as a digital user to sort of uh, strengthen our community and uh, also this this i mean just just one uh, last comment on this idea that uh, you know what we talked about that developed nation actually have these courses on digital literacy in their primary school uh, education but what about the developing world because even they are producing digital users so i think uh, i mean it it remains an intervention that i need that i intend to flag down the line that governments should also you know the uh, world of uh, uh, you know governments from the developing world too should be including the Uh, ideas of digital literacy in their curriculum and and, and it's very important i believe thank you pranima and please uh, leave in the chat how individuals can connect with you about your work and the questions that you've asked and we are going to move on right now uh, we will be taking time away from the 5 minute break so we will no longer have a 5 minute break since we started late and to give each of our remaining five ambassadors time for their presentations we will shave off a couple of minutes from their 10 minutes q&a section to make sure that we can get to everyone and we are moving on now to some more uh, presentations that are a bit more granular in the internet and interesting uh some deeper topics and some more technical and uh policy topics for those on the call who are interested in these these issues uh next up we have Jeremy Bernick from the US they will be talking to us today about CDN centralization and monopoly of the global edge networks Jeremy you have the floor thank you uh can everyone hear me okay Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Yes, I can hear you. And the share screen function is back. You see your monopoly guy. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. I'm glad that uh, you know that's brought up. So, um my name is Jeremy Bernick. Uh, I'm representing the Internet Society here as a global youth ambassador. Um, today I'll be speaking from Canada, but uh technically I reside in the US and I conduct research um as a interdisciplinary scholar on the structural risks the current and future internet at the University of Arizona um today I'll be presenting briefly on a major structural risk facing the current and future internet specifically the largely invisible crisis of centralization and monopolization of the global edge networks by private US content delivery network operators I'll go a little bit deeper into that in a little bit that's kind of a brief uh, thesis and overview. Um this will be kind of a hybrid lecture uh critical analysis uh because this is obviously a topic that isn't going to be familiar to everybody. Um so I'll briefly go into what the CDN is and why it's important for us to talk about um especially with infrastructural issues like that were happening today at this conference um and hopefully we can kind of tie it all together to understand why this is a you know a major issue affecting all of us. Um In the early days of our shared internet, many of the users of the internet were far less concerned with their connection speeds and their ability to surf the web. However, as our commercial era in the 90s uh began, the creation of faster and smaller server technologies, sites and the the web browser like Google, led to a disastrous chain of events resulting in what is an insatiable consumer desire for both speed and access. As the mobile computing era began with the iPhone and Android about a decade ago, speed and access became a very intrinsic necessity for all of us as significant parts of the internet world came online. And as a result, new web optimization formats and network architectures, and this is where the CDN stuff comes in, uh, were constructed that would alleviate the speed and access problems that would bring the nearest point of presence closer to you and user. Uh, this became popularly known as the edge and it's mostly just talked about in network communities but it's 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 very very deeply important to um topics on access and the digital divide as well um but the edge is also known as a content delivery network era uh which is better better example of what we know it as today uh, but what i would be asking in this presentation is 
at what cost did this consolidation harm future users? And at what cost to the future stability of the internet um, has all this centralization done? Um, in the first decade of this new CDN Arch architecture, the consequences appear to be minor. Uh, through the creation of CDNs, both consumers and internet companies saw better round trip speeds, noticeably lower costs to internet end users, and reduced bandwidth and transit costs for uh, internet service providers. Seemingly, this was a positive sum gain for all stakeholders. In fact, for some companies like Netflix, which we all use, it flourished mainly because of their proprietary internal content delivery network called OpenConnect. But for companies that don't have excessive wealth from monopolizing their industry, there are far less options for CDN providers. These companies all around the world are subjected to choosing from only a few US-based global monopolies in the CDN space, like Akamai, Cloudflare, or AWS's Cloudflare. Today, the biggest CDN market share is Cloudflare, which reportedly owns nearly 20% of the new CDN usage market uh, since 2018. In the last decade, this hyper-consolidation, as I see it, of the CDN space has led to a major market monopoly, similar to Google and Amazon today and other you know, uh, sectors. Due to the just nature of the volume economics of building infrastructure globally at scale, that costs that much money. Um, as a result of the high cost of entry for competition, what you end up seeing is that there can be only a few major market price setters in this space, and down the road, it's only gonna get worse. But strangely, this is not the only major issue at stake. As a result of market consolidation, private ownership, and government deregulation and tangent, when things do break in the CDN space, whether by internal accident or due to external forces, all of us suffer. In recent years, dozens of global outages have rocked major websites, nations, and the global economy due to just small mistakes by innocent network engineers at these CDNs. For example, in 2019, the major privately owned ISP Verizon, which is a major US ISP, accidentally leaked a large subnet, which means just a big um, pool of address spaces, um, a Dash 20 address, of the CDN service Cloudflare, an incorrect router, or an autonomous system technically, in rural Pennsylvania. To spare any more technical details, the consequence was as soon as the route address was posted, a large swath of Cloudflare's major clients went down. The results were complete chaos, only seen recently in the Facebook outage a couple months ago. The engineer who wrote the postmortem, so kind of the account of death after the incident for Cloudflare started by saying, today, the internet had a small heart attack. This incident not only took down Cloudflare, but it also took down Amazon, Linode, and many other major platforms for several hours globally. In my opinion, this can't keep happening, and especially going forward to the oversight of just these private companies and engineers who don't understand the risks that we all face. Um, at this point, the internet has become a critical and life-saving service globally, and I don't think we can go down this path any longer. Catastrophic outages like these are an immediate and dire risk to all of us as stakeholders globally. And to me, this is the worst part. This is where us as ambassadors really do come in. Um, as of May of this year, um, independent researchers at UC Berkeley in the US found that the internet um, has, or has shown that the internet has continued to prosper as a project of US capital interests and hegemonic power. Across the spectrum of core internet infrastructure, US companies and the US government itself remain largely in control of all of our futures, the stability of the globally shared internet that we should all be owning. And most disturbingly, the CDN space, which is the basis of all of this, is the most blatant and corrupt example. Today, 97.6%, so only 2% uh, don't. So 97.6% of websites globally that use the CDN service are using a US-based company. Going forward, I'd like to collaborate and help to restructure a truly globally owned internet. I don't think we have one right now. Thank you.
Thank you, Jeremy, for a very insightful presentation. Do you have a, a question that you'd like to open up the conversation with, by chance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as the only uh, representative from the U.S., I think um, I'm in a position of privilege to where my access and my experience of the Internet is uh, uniquely benefited from this system. Um, and what I would ask to all of you is, um, clearly, from the you know higher end levels of our of our work as scholars um, and as activists, um, we can do work on the ground. But but how do we address some of these kind of structural foundational questions of the internet? The fact that you know the U.S. government owns most of the core infrastructure. Um, can we get to a point where we can distribute this across Latin America, across Africa, across Asia? To where everyone is owning and sharing and operating on the same level rather than just one nation. Thank you for your question, Jeremy. For anyone in the audience that would like to comment or answer that question or engage in that conversation, please do. I see we have a ping from someone that's live in Poland. Do you have a comment or question? Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, my name is Veronica. I'm a former uh, IGF US ambassador. So my first comment uh, um, is to give my con congratulations to all the 2021 IGF US ambassador because we are following your work uh, from here in Katowice, and um, I would like to congratulate and to tell that we also appreciate the work you have done, um, at least uh, virtually there. Um, hopefully, we will uh, meet next year. My question for Jeremy is that um, I also work on the CDNS. Um, um, I think last year um, for an ICANN project. And uh, my question for you is if you have considered to uh, apply uh, the Internet Society uh, Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit, because, they are, because I know that they have developed this toolkit um, that is um, they is uh, connected to their project of the internet way of networking. So my question is if you ever considered or you have done it yet uh, to apply, you know, that, that kind of toolkit, or you know, you know that toolkit. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. And thank you on behalf of um, all of us for uh, paving the way for us and for making it all the way to Katowice. Um, Yes, I, I actually do. Um, I'm a big fan of the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit, um, and I use it. Um, I, I work on uh, several projects in the U.S. with other scholars, and one of them is actually uh, funded by the Internet Society. His name is um, it's for the Daylight uh, Lab at UC Berkeley, and they study um, Internet fragmentation, which is another really interesting topic that we should all be deeply concerned about, which means kind of that the Internet is splitting, um, and there's kind of fragments and sovereign internets forming. Um, and so how do we look at kind of the uh, consequences of that and what are the, uh, you know, signs infrastructurally uh, that point to those? Um, so I, I really appreciate you bringing attention to that, Veronica, because I know that um, other ambassadors in this cohort will definitely benefit from that. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Is there any other questions? Yes, of course. Um, hello, uh, Pedro again, uh, for the record. Um, I just have maybe a comment more than a question about the, you were talking about the United States government influence, but I believe that you should also take a look, not just in the government sphere, but also at the at private sector space, because the big question that is happening today and nowadays is <laughs> exactly on the center of the debate that's happening right here. It's this IGF on the, during the COVID-19 pandemic as well. That is how the 
even the multi-stakeholder model is centered about, uh, centered on, some in some places, in some aspects, the way that the private sector of the United States wanted the way that the internet uh, would be structured about uh, the way they wanted it to, to go. So uh, there are some subtle ways that this happens. There are some ways that some values that everyone has uh, in this internet governance ecosystem, some values that are advocated uh, strongly on every space, every internet governance school that happens, and they are strongly derived from this uh, private sector interests. So I believe that uh, there has been in the last years a uh, kind of uh, sharing of power from the United States government, but this sharing of power is ending up going to the hands of the some United States company. So I believe that part should also be a strong focus of what you are looking upon, what you are working with. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Pedro. That's a really insightful comment, and it actually opens up a couple threads that I'll touch on really quickly. Um, I think that the nature of the U.S. government and the U.S. private sector is one of a very toxic and kind of disgusting kind of imperial hold on the rest of the world. And um, it's in my interest that that doesn't remain so for the next century. Um, but I would say that there, at least from my perspective in academia and from, you know, being in the private sector previously uh, in the CDN space, that there's far less that you can do to tangibly change um, that sort of industry capture. I know ICANN specifically struggles with that where most of, you know, the ICANN operation is just, you know, private sector and, uh, you know, influencers in there. And so something like the IGF is really great because it, it you know, actually opens it up to multi-stakeholder participation in a meaningful sense. Um, and I know that there's developments like the IGF leadership panel that kind of maybe threaten the overall stability of, you know, independent voices like ours. Um, and so it's, you know, it's definitely on kind of my front radar to, to ensure that, you know, uh, the IGF doesn't fall into that same sort of either government or industry capture um, where it just becomes kind of a playground for the uh, the private sector or government elites uh, to decide our futures. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. And if you can wrap up your session in the next 30 seconds and let folks on the call know how, the, how can we continue following your work and where can we connect with you to contribute or continue this dialogue going forward throughout the IGF and beyond? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, you can contact me at my email. I'll, I'll share it in the chat. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Um, I'd be happy to collaborate with anybody. I work in issues of law, political economy, economic theory, um, and technical infrastructure. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of happy to bridge the gap for wherever you guys are. So thank you. Thank you again, Jeremy. And for all the folks in Poland who were able to contribute with their comments and questions, we're going to move along to our next IGF Youth Ambassador, James Declaris. James is joining us from Haiti, and he'll be talking on empowering responsible digital citizens. James, you have the floor. Thank you, Magali. And thank you everyone for joining this wonderful discussion. And my intervention will be about digital literacy and meaningful connectivity and world ideas, and mostly a case that we are experiencing in Haiti. Um, I am James Declarus. I was born in Lamar, which is an isolated world area in Hesh, IT. This is a way to let you know that my childhood was marked by the abs absence of electricity, healthcare, digital technologies, and a lot of other things that could make a huge, a great impact on a child's life. I remember this day, my father went to Hesh and he bought a small black radio. And you know what, what happened? I broke, I broke the radio days later. You know why? It was just because I was looking for the people talking inside of the radio. 
for me, they were inside of inside of it, and I couldn't understand that people talked aloud inside such a small device. And my my father and happy for happy for me this moment. He said, "Hey man, are you crazy? What are you doing?" But he quickly understood that it was a lack of understanding from my part. I didn't really understand what happened. And he promised me to break me to the radio station and where exactly the people talked and make me understood that the device was uh, just a receiver. Actually, there are some, you know, some evolutions because, you know, smartphones are so popular. But compared to the rest of the world, Haiti is still far behind. In 2008, I was 15 and I saw a computer for the first time in my life. It was fascinating to me. And when I started the computer 101, like an introduction to computer um, class at the public school that I attended, I realized two things. The first one is I, will, I realized that I missed a lot of things during my childhood. Like it was like I missed 10 years out of the world due of no internet connection and no access to computer. And the second one, I quickly understood that computers and internet represent the future. And since then, I have seen a great passion started growing inside of me. This passion, I would like to share it with you. It was made the highest degree possible in computer science and be back in the world community to bring where I was born at the, at, at the first time, to bring digital literacy knowledge and experience to world kids that are facing the same situation that I've faced during my childhood. In 2019, before joining Hope for Height IT, it is a nonprofit organization. I joined as a computer lab coordinator. I co found the Kukak Computer Project. Kukak is what I can um, call an affordable model of delivering technology to world kids in Haiti. Let me take a little bit to explain you how the model works. Kukak, the model is like, is a mobile model. model. Our key um, items and operations are, we have one motorcycle, we have 15 computers, and we design a month long curriculum. And as we don't have internet connection in our area, we use internet in a box. And this small device, we implement module of Wikipedia Khan Academy and a lot of, of other content that can be accessed on, uh, offline. Um, my experience both at Hope for Haiti and Kika Kumper Project make me realize that lack of digital literacy in world areas in Haiti is alarming. For example, our surveys just show, show that 98% of world kids aged from 7 to 17 years old have no experience with computers and has no access to the internet. You know, this is during, even during the pandemic where the number of internet users increased in other parts of the world, but not, not big thing has been done in Haiti. Like we were not moved like too much. With Hope for Haiti, I led this project and we built 20 computer labs in Southern Haiti. With the Kukak model, we already teach digital literacy to 600 plus um, children in rural areas in, in Haiti. Part of um, this intervention today is like a call of action. The idea behind Kukak is to um, train rural kids in their earlier age. So no matter when they have access to the real internet connection, they can behave like a responsible um, cit digital citizen because at Internet um, Governance Forum, we talk about privacy, about connectivity, and we are working to have everybody connected. 
connected, unconnected. So QuickCrack is working to see how we can start training those uh, people out of connection, actually. And in the future, no matter when they have access to the real internet connection, they can behave responsible by protecting themselves and others. Thank you, James, for your conversation. We need to move into your open discussion and Q&A. So if you yeah. can please move us into an open discussion, what would be one question that you have for the audience to get you, engaged with your discussion? Before asking, my, before asking my question, I would like to share my screen a little bit. Okay, and I just need to remind you that we have a reduced amount of time to get to the rest of our speakers okay, today. Perfect. So please be brief. Yes, I will. I will. Okay, let me share. Okay, I can't share. But actually, as I told you, we use an offline internet connection just to simulate um, internet connection for our for for our children. But we want to bring the real internet connection to them. I would like to ask um, the attendees if they have experience with like. Um, will internet connection a way that we can make will internet connection possible in rural communities where access is very difficult thank you thank you for your question james and please leave in the chat james how folks can connect with you to learn more about your project and to continue the conversation unfortunately due to the uh, reduced amount of time for our session I think that we should move on to our next speakers. So James, please leave in the chat how folks can connect with you and respond to your question and continue the conversation. I just wanna make sure that we can get to our next three speakers before our session ends. Up next, we have Eliana Fran joining us from Argentina and she will be talking about regulation for universal access. Eliana, you have the floor. Thank you, Marley. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I don't know what it is for me. It's like late in the night. Um, I will try to keep it brief. Um, I will start by saying that the uptake of the internet has accelerated during the pandemic, which is, of course, great news. And since 2019, the number of users has increased 800 million, uh, reaching 4.9 billion in 2021. Uh, that is roughly 63% of the population. And as we know, behind this type of numbers, there are gaps such as gender, age, urban versus rural, uh, for which numbers I, I will not get into. However, I want to be emphatic about this one. Uh, from the 2.9 billion people that remain offline, 96% of them live in developing countries. With that in mind, a lot of literature says that internet access create a, creates a beneficial ripple effect in the economy, expands opportunities, and strengthens communications, regardless of industrial sector or geographic location. For instance, assuming a 10% increase in fixed broadband penetration, North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean will enjoy an increase of, of 1.9% in GDP per capita. Then, when we think about the internet as a general purpose technology that creates opportunities across the entire economy, I think leaving no one behind, uh, it is a more imperative that we cannot look away from. I believe this situation inevitably falls under what internet governance is, not only shaping the evolution and protecting the way the internet works, but also safeguarding the value that it has as an enabler. And within internet governance, the multi-stakeholder approach, as we know it, is chosen due to its adherence to principles such as inclusivity, openness, and bottom-up decision-making. Um, and when thinking about a major actor of universal access, in my mind, immediately goes to regulatory entities, one of the actors considered in the model and my personal area of, of interest. I think the AGF is not only for regulator entities to execute their stakeholder role, but also to bring this model back home. This means becoming transparent, inclusive, and open. Uh, replicating the IGF model as we know it within countries uh, for the telecommunications regulations can solely be a beneficial ripple effect. I'm currently working on a project looking at governmental regulation and its impact of universal access. And one of the items that I'm seeing so far is fairly evident. Uh, in broadband services, competition and price are related. 
suggesting, if not confirming, that fostering a multiplayer market makes the fixed internet service more affordable and consequently enhances accessibility. Circling back to regulatory entities, why is, the, why is it important that they uptake the model uh, from the IGF? Um, as a reminder, transparency, inclusion, open practices, because decisions that are made hastily or through closed door procedures, proceedings can undermine the regulator's credibility and create a perception of undue influence, which in many cases has caused a level of uncertainty that hinders private investments, ultimately preventing infrastructures from being developed, creating barriers of entry to the market and harming the creation of competition, which is the way to achieve a countrywide offering of affordable internet. A different analysis that I'm doing shows that uh, countries that promote competition, for instance, by creating license, <clears throat> flexi flexible licensing frameworks and performing their function transparently, those countries are also most likely to engage in universal access policy practices, such as promoting free or low cost public internet access in public libraries or what have you. A multi-stakeholder approach that gives rise to, com to confidence in regulatory decisions can be achieved by a number of approaches, uh, such as evidence-based decision-making, regulatory impact analysis, public consultations, commitments to transparency and no discrimination. Um, I do believe that the multi-stakeholder approach is not to be left in Poland, uh, but is to be taken home as well. And my question for you all, and I'm fully aware that there are a lot of unknown unknowns in policy making, and that is one of the reasons that I believe this room is so valuable, the diversity of perspective. Uh, so I invite you to share your thoughts. If we are short on time, I will uh, leave in the chat box the ways of reaching. And my questions are, how can we advance flexible regulations for an enabling market that allows more people to be connected to affordable internet? And what mechanisms are to be put in place for this and what hinders it? Thank you. Thank you, Eliana. I would say let's give this five to six minutes for individuals attending the session who would like to comment or answer Eliana's question. Uh, please raise your hand or on mute. And uh, you're also welcome to leave your question and comments in the chat. Um. Just so I know, is there anyone with the hands raised? Because I don't want to... No, you are free to continue our guest in Poland. So this is uh, this was a very interesting exposition because it's exactly what I was talking about, the differences, or the cultural differences about approaching the internet governance models and types of uh, ways to uh, see how how we want them to work and the thing is when we're talking about this latin american perspective uh, when we're talking about freedom in the internet governance ecosystem sometimes it's necessary to have some at least a certain level of regulation to approach it for example uh, as to make it possible to new agents to enter the markets it's important that we create some barriers so the big agents, the already established agents, cannot just buy them every time they appear, every time they're starting to make a difference in these regions. And it's really interesting that someone uh, from the youth ambassadors is working on that aspect. This, this is probably one of the hardest questions that we have today in internet governance. Uh, as you know, there is no easy or rigid answer to that but it's uh, i congratulate uh, the this project because having a national uh, specific approach to this kind of question oh what in argentina for example or in south america what are the kind of regulation that we need to make uh, to empower uh, smaller agents here that wants to get into this kind of market that wants to promote some values that we think are important. So I'm really happy to see, to see this. And I would like to also to congratulate all other ambassadors. The projects here are being amazing. And saying that I'll, uh, I'm sorry that I'll have to leave right now for another session.
but it's been an amazing experience and you all have some great projects. I'm really, really happy to have seen these things and these expositions. Thank you for your contribution, your comments, and for actively engaging with us from over there in Poland. Eliana, I'll leave it to you for any closing remarks, and then we will move on to our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Marley, and thank you for the comment. Uh, it's really encouraging uh, to speak with people that understand what complex situation this is. And the short answer is there is no short answer. As we know, policy doesn't travel well, and what works for a country may not work or uh, may need uh, to suffer a lot of adaptations uh, to specific locally based contacts. Uh, for instance, in Argentina, we have a way of providing um, broadband services for uh, small internet companies within the country to uh, resell uh, the internet. And that is a model that has worked, uh, but it has a lot to do with the geographic diversity and the local market and how private investors may not find it profitable to reach certain populations and the population distribution is just uh, is not something that we can look away from and we need to get the internet to them. So that pushes uh, the lookout for different solutions uh, being broadband uh, fiber optic or being satellite solutions. Um, but yeah, I'm looking into these challenges. I will drop my contact information in the chat box and I'm happy to continue any conversation. Thank you very much, Eliana. Up next, we have Luis Eduardo Martelli da Silva from Brazil. He will be talking to us today about internet intermediaries, liability regime and factors. Uh, Louise, you have the floor and I will do my best to pull up your slides. Uh, hopefully this is going to work and please do prompt me to switch the slides as you're talking and as you would like me to move through them. Kimberly, uh, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for, for being here. And I'm going to talk about internet intermediaries liability and more specifically the existence of many types of intermediaries and how it uh, impacts on regulation. So my goal here is not very much to, to teach you about internet intermediaries liability or share any specific thesis, but much more to provide context and to, to, to raise some questions, which is uh, the main goal. Uh, you, can, you can put in the next one, please. Thank you, Marilee. So uh, for those who are not very familiar with the topic, uh, internet intermediaries are actors that facilitate the transmission of information generated by content producers. And intermediary liability is um, the legal responsibilities um, for, the con for this content published uh, by these users. So uh, we have many uh, liabil liability regimes such as um, strict liability, uh, safe harbor model, which uh, consists of uh, notice and takedown procedures and broad immunity. And it, involves, it also involves many, many uh, problems uh, in our daily lives, such as um, freedom of expression rights, uh, privacy and data protection rights, fair trial and remedy, and uh, due process rights for uh, taking down content, uh, content and equality on non-discrimination rights for uh, biased uh, decisions. You can uh, change the slides, please. You can put in the next one, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, chat, I 
logistics, all the environment, and social platforms, and changing, and you know, the way of how to get down to the trade, to uh, legal um, uh, services, with uh, many countries uh, reach out. So it's a very complex scenario. If you want to be really uh, using the inside information, you have a very important study of that word, that case. So um, it, it can change mentally. And um, there are some proposals for uh, countries like um, categorizing the internet into areas for regulation proposals. So um, in the uh, in one example from my study, for instance, is a different industry by limiting content from uh, the internet on one platform and it provides um, the internet into many areas based on uh, six tags. So this becomes the activity that they will need, the event type, so a web hosting provider, uh, a search engine, uh, advertising platform, uh, based on the sector of travel, if you are e-commerce uh, platform, fintech, accommodation, uh, based on the use of uh, data, if they are data enabled uh, operators or uh, data enhanced operators, um, on the cargo actions, on the service of revenue, and on the level of uh, control. So changing many things, and based on uh, the sectors and this uh, on the nature of the intermediary and on the complexity of the services that they um, that they provide, uh, there are three sectors that we should be taking into consideration, I would say, uh, because there is a difference between the uh, the energy intermediaries and uh, the lower level intermediaries. So if you take um, if you have access to the content, then you are being categorized based on abstraction. So, for example, the uh, hotel rankings, they uh, can be um, they come from because of the spoken language, and the lower level they um, they, they they see more as the call of trade language, which is uh, conceptual and complex enough to uh, allow them to to have. Uh, Access to the content because of uh, if you want to expose your uh, product to as well, and we, we can think of it as the wheel of the street. Yeah, so if you take the sound of the street, you're going to um, you, you're going to undermine the, the sound of the wheels of the street. You're going to undermine the whole system, and kind of in the same way, if you um, impose a control mechanism upon some lower level intermediaries, then you're going to undermine the, 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 the you're going to get access to activity of all the other service providers that come uh, up to them, yeah? So, uh, you can also raise the question, like, should we uh, regulate them in the same way based on the different uh, activities that they do have? And the second one, the, the second sector that I think should be taken into consideration are the risks of uh, imposing control on intermediaries. So depending on the weight of what you do, if you want to take into consideration other systems, so you do not create credible promises, you can um, restrict as well as limitations. So maybe you cannot inform them through a regulation, uh, innovation, and I think that we can um, conciliate both things. So for example, pay boxes model will can enable one one search in one business model to develop for both oversight and it can be very effective and also it can um, violate uh, freedom of uh, expression rights because uh, it can allow courts to understand the capability of the public to in a more sophisticated way uh, allow it to to have intermediary with the quality so they all fall on the same um, on, on the same scope, if you like, the same content. Uh, so uh, you can you can uh, go to the next one, which the last one too, I think that's it. And I just want to raise uh, some some questions. I, I think uh, there's two minutes for the uh, the event manager Shelly to have.
Thank you, Louisa, for your uh, your contribution. And do we have one more person in Poland that would like to comment? Please uh, keep it brief. We have one more speaker that we need to get to. Um, uh, hi, Louisa. I'm here from Katowice. Um, my answer to your question would be yes. Um, I think it's, I mean, it's a, not, not only advisable, but it's necessary to make this classification according, you know, between infrastructural operators and between the service operators. And this is something that ISOC has already worked on with the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit, because if, when you, um, you know, deem liable the infrastructural operator, then you when then you got to impact uh, the functioning. Uh, of the internet itself. So we have to make a distinction because we, we cannot deem as a, a whole thing the service that is the shallow you know, layer and the infrastructural layer because we cannot um, confuse the two things. The infrastructural operators, they have no control over the content. Why maybe, um, you know, uh, service operator, they have control over the content. So this is why you have to make the distinction between or the classification as you, um, as you mentioned before. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Ja. Ähm, ich meine, ich bin Jurist, äh, ich bin Politiker, ich habe das Studium von Wissenschaft äh, und Computer Science, äh, University Classification, das ist es. Ich ignore that uh, many other uh, factors, many other business models, many other ignorance. So um, you can find me uh, get in touch, you can find me on my email, uh, on my uh, on my LinkedIn, on my chat on my chat, and also in my Telegram I think uh, this was the uh, about the starting to 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 get along to uh, my colleague Phil Richter who just wrote and he was uh, on Saturday night, and I was introduced on the site to some of my friends uh, on Saturday morning to be here and to do this uh, Saturday event uh, on PEG. So yes, uh, we're going to, to, to talk about the work of uh, Mark Klausen on this uh, subject, which is in the, the concept of the intellectual uh, guidelines for the international um, internet intermediaries. Um, thank you so much, Thank you for inviting me to this talk. So please go on to the virtual elements aspect of the IGF website and look for the Internet Society virtual booth, which should be in the lower, uh, the lower halls. Uh, so please do explore that after the session today. Next up, we have our last IGF Youth Ambassador speaker, Stella Teo, joining us from Malaysia. She will be talking about the intersection of philosophy and the web to close us out today. And Stella, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Marilee. So greetings, everyone. I don't think I'll share this, uh, the slides that I prepared. It was only a brief uh, slide, so anyway. So I just wanted to talk about uh, philosophy and the web. So the reason why I feel like I needed to highlight and why I wanted to research about the intersection between these two disciplines is mainly because like, when people think of philosophy, they see it as kind of dead or uh, without any place in the future, especially with the web and how important the web is now. So philosophy is like, well, out of, uh, not up to date. And I'd like to challenge that because like um, there's a quote from Sir Tim Berners-Lee about how the web, he viewed the web actually as something um, which is philosophical engineering. So for him, physics and the web were both, they had the similar relationship that they were about the relationship between the small and the large. So in terms of what I wanted to kind of uh, research or like uh, do surveys about, it, the intersection between this philosophy and the web was mainly, for instance, ASEAN youth's perspective towards things like uh, digital identity. So I do believe that there is a little bit of a divide in how the East and West may view uh, how parts or facets of your identity spill over from your real life into your digital life or how some people manage to keep like um, I'm not sure if it's positive or negative, but they keep their digital identity separate from their physical of uh, real life identity. And one thing that uh, ph philosophy of the web touches on is how the web has changed how we view knowledge. So like historically speaking, if you were to say someone was knowledgeable, they actually do whole pieces of information in their head. For instance, specific uh, names of uh, capitals or countries, etc. But now with Google and the internet, all this is, has come has uh, transformed into being information at our fingertips, but not actually within us, like at the moment of asking. So it's changed what it means to have knowledge. And that also draws into certain things like aspects of reality. Uh, do we consider like, you know, potentially the mind to be uh, widened by the fact that you're online? And of course, I think the aspect of philosophy that most people are familiar with in terms of the web would be moral philosophy. So things like ethics, ethics concerning AI, artificial intelligence, et cetera. So I'm just gonna keep this brief and short, but for me, I decided that for my IGF youth ambassadorship, I wanted to concentrate on seeing how philosophy could be kind of revitalized and to not be forgotten, especially when we speak of digital literacy, like so many previous uh, ambassadors touched upon the importance of digital literacy and how it contributes to digital citizenship. But I also feel that uh, the lacking part there that potentially could have more focus is um, the philosophical side of these questions. So like uh, things about the identity, knowledge and ethics. So that's it for me. I'll put my LinkedIn in the chat and yep 
Thank you, Stella. And I apologize to our ambassadors that we had to really rush through these presentations of your topics to make sure that we got to everyone today. Um, Stella, if you can repeat your question that you may have to the audience again, that will be much appreciated. Okay, I think um, one question I'd like to uh, ask everyone would just be like, uh, do you think philosophy is really dead now that you've heard like, you know, a few of the little ties that I've drawn outside? Do you think philosophy really doesn't have a place in discussions about internet governance, discussions about the web? Or do you think maybe you need some time to think about it? And yeah, just that, just food for thought. We have Anurag, you have the floor with your feedback or question. Yeah, hi, am I audible? Yeah, uh, thanks, yes, thanks a lot Stella, for the, uh, for the uh, amazing, uh, sh short, but uh, very informative uh, presentation. Um, I kind of, uh, I believe that philosophy does have a uh, very pertinent role in the present times in internet discussion, especially when it comes to privacy uh, and, uh, and even more into privacy about encryption and who has, whether the government has the power to take away encryption and other things. And moreover, when it comes to child rights issues, as well, uh, and cybersecurity is one of the other things as well. So I definitely do believe that it is not dead, but people have sort of uh, sort of adopted the way uh, philosophy has been dealt in in uh, in other subjects. Not particularly calling it philosophy, but calling it more uh, policy-based subjects, and not really realizing that they're pretty much dealing with uh, the philosophy of things. Having said that, I just have a small question, if you wouldn't if you wouldn't mind, uh, about your presentation. You mentioned that uh, digital identity is has become something different to physical identity. Um, what are exact? What are your sort of a uh, couple of your views on that, specifically in the philosophical point of view? Thanks. Oh, okay. Thank. Uh, thank you so much, Anurag, and a uh, great. Uh, views on like how yeah philosophy actually has evolved to be like kind of assimilated but um people don't really view it as like the traditional uh philosophy that we know which is great and on the topic of digital identity i think the first thing that people would think of mainly is like the issue between youths and how there's the potential that uh, facets of their identity can be affected or through the way they communicate online, which sometimes leads to a divide in how they feel, for instance, like, I mean, the, the most normal thing would be like how people who can't really socialize properly in real life uh, feel a, a greater sense of belonging in online because they're e e it's easier for them to find communities that accept them. But for the philosophical side of it, it's more like the notion of embodiment. So they may learn, they may somehow result like there's there are a few Black Mirror uh, episodes that do talk about this. How some people may uh, have this kind of feeling where instead they want to forego the material or physical world and say like, hey, it's kind of useless for me to go out there. Why don't I just you know focus on the virtual world, the augmented reality where I have more control, where I can be myself, etc. So I think that notion of embodiment is like something that they they want well the philosophy of web talks about but it's also something that i'm learning about as time goes by and i think that was a great question and it does tie in with things like you know uh, internet governance in terms of age verification uh on websites etc so yep thank you for answering that thanks Okay, everyone, I'm just dropping in our chat section a link to the virtual booth schedule where we can continue the conversations that some of our ambassadors have been having today at the CLX. Uh, thank you, ambassadors and attendees, for your patience and your perseverance, despite all of the technical difficulties that we faced getting on the call today and even during the session today. Uh, we all had to witness some things that we should not have to, and I want to acknowledge that and hope for all of you continuing on to future IGF sessions that you have a better uh, experience getting on to the sessions and during your sessions. Please do, uh, if you haven't already grabbed the information from each of the ambassadors that they've posted in the chat section, Please do take the remaining minutes in the session to do so and connect, follow up, 
uh, collaborate. We want to uh, get as many people working together on the issues and topics that were discussed today. Uh, thank you, Stella, for closing us out with your presentation on the philosophy of internet and the web and the future of the internet. Again, please do continue the conversation with our ambassadors in our virtual booth. The link is in the chat. Um, and I will open the floor for the last minute for any closing remarks from our, for our ambassadors, from our ambassadors. All right, thank you everyone for making the time to attend, for staying on the call. We had a few of you who dropped, or uh, who were disconnected from the call and who persevered and we were able to get you back connected to the sessions. Thank you to the IGF and to the Internet Society for creating this platform for our IGF youth ambassadors to present their initiatives and the important work that they're doing around the world, locally in their own regions. Thank you for our attendees who have stayed on the call, who have asked your questions, who have given some insightful feedback, and who have shown interest in continuing the conversation with our ambassadors. I wish you all a uh, eventful, uh, knowledge-filled, engaging, interactive rest of the IGF. And I hope to see some of your faces uh, in future sessions coming up today and for the rest of the week. Um, have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are around the world. And thank you again for attending the session. And thank you IGF teams who have done an amazing job at keeping us on track and boosting all of the essential people that should not have been on the call out. Thank you everyone, have a great rest of your day. See you all in future sessions. Bye, everyone.